Great, thanks so much. Um, so for those of you who I haven't met before, um, I'm Anna Morenz. I'm one of the R3s in the primary care track. And I'm really excited to be giving this talk today on um, physiology of pregnancy for the internist and subspecialist. And no disclosures to make. And I just wanna thank Dr. Nina Tan and Dr. Alson Burke, one of the OBGYNs who works at Harborview for reviewing these slides. Um, and Dr. Burke is also joining us today. Um, so she'll be helping answer any questions that you have in the chat and um, responding to questions at the end. And feel free to interrupt me and put any questions in the chat that you have. Um, so first, I just wanna situate this talk within a number of incredible women's health talks that we've had this year, including already a talk by Sylvia Stellmacher in February on counseling patients becoming pregnant <clears throat> and identifying teratogenic medications in pregnancy as well as Becca Ellis's talk on medication abortion for the internist. In my three years of residency, I've never seen an academic half day talk on pregnancy or abortion. Um, and so it feels, this feels particularly important um, given the news this week regarding Roe v. Wade um, for internists to be involved in this work and this advocacy. Um, so I'm really excited to see all this content and. Um, I'm trying not to be repetitive with my talk today, um, so I won't be covering much preconception counseling or options counseling for women, even though I do think these are roles that internists can take. So um, my objectives are going to be to refamiliarize ourselves with common physiologic versus pathologic changes during pregnancy and develop a deeper understanding of how these changes affect management of pregnant individuals in subspecialty, general internal medicine, and consultative medicine. Second, I hope to explore common causes of maternal mortality and disparities in maternal mortality in the US and the role that internists can play in helping to reduce maternal mortality. And lastly, to discuss obstetric history that may be important to elicit in history taking for the patient and the potential health risks conferred by conditions during pregnancy. So first, I want to start with a case um, that a patient that I took care of this year from Montlake. So this was a 30-year-old G4P1021, and I've reminded you of your Gs and Ps up there in the right-hand corner. Um, she has a history of lupus on hydroxychloroquine, hypertension, prior miscarriages, but APLS negative, currently 10 weeks pregnant on anoxaparin per her OB, and she's coming in with shortness of breath for the last three weeks. She's noticed initially she had some shortness of breath with stairs, but now she's experiencing dyspnea with minimal exertion. She feels dizzy and faint, but hasn't had any syncope, had some chest discomfort yesterday while laying flat or while changing positions in the middle of the night It improved with drinking water. She's not had any orthopnea or PND, does have some increased swelling in her feet, no joint pains or rashes, no abdominal pain or other GI symptoms. Um, she went to an outside hospital initially and she was found to be very hypertensive, 170s over hundreds. Otherwise she was comfortable appearing. Um, so what other questions might you have right now? Any initial thoughts? Um, feel free to just unmute or throw something in the chat. Initial impressions that might be running through your mind. Uh, so people are wondering if preeclampsia can occur this early, anemia, PE. Exactly. Common things being common that we see as causes of shortness of breath. Um, yeah, thinking about peripartum cardiomyopathy rings a bell, but 10 weeks, can that really present this early? Um, yeah, her prior pregnancy history, were there any complications, any hypertension? Um, I think I was also thinking about her history of lupus. Um, like, could this be some kind of lupus flare or related to her underlying lupus disease? Um, love it. Yeah. Thinking about blood pressure, cutoffs in pregnant individuals versus non-pregnant, um, any effusions. 
so getting a little bit more data about her. So her BM, in terms of her lab work, her BMP was normal. She did have some anemia, um, thrombocytopenia, uh, platelet count of 40 from prior baseline in the 140s. Um, albumin was 2.8. Her INR was elevated, uh, normal D-dimer. BNP was markedly elevated. Um, her anti-DS DNA was elevated, but C3 and C4 were similar to prior. Um, we obtained some imaging data. So she had a chest X-ray showing a borderline heart size. Her echo was remarkable for notching of the pulmonic valve and a pulmonary artery systolic pre pressure of 145 millimeters of mercury. Her RV was moderately dilated with normal to mildly reduced systolic function. And an abdominal ultrasound showed early cirrhosis, um, mild splenomegaly and recanalization of the periumbilical vein, and concerning findings of ectopia cordis and cystic hygroma of the 10 week gestation. So, a lot of very um, concerning findings from this imaging. And so, these are, we won't get into all this right now, but the questions that were going through my mind and that I want you to be mulling over as we're going through the content here is how do you think about interpreting lab data in a pregnant patient? How would you build a differential? And what are you thinking about for next steps? And we'll come back to this case at the end, but this is really the premise for, um, for my wanting to, to delve into this content a bit more. So to get into the physiology of pregnancy, taking us um, back to med school, um, just for a reminder of sort of the trimesters of pregnancy. Um, and um, I find these little fruits kind of helpful to think about sizes. So for the first trimester, we, that takes us from week one through week 12, which takes us to the end of approximately the plum size here. And so our patient um, is around week 10 with the cherry here. Second trimester takes us from the peach to approximately the egg. plant of uh, week 26 and then third trimester takes us from week 27 with this pumpkin to the end of pregnancy. Um, in terms of hormonal changes, we're seeing um, HCG spiking at the end of the first trimester and that's going to be driving a lot of the symptoms of morning sickness. And so that's why those are typically improving into the second trimester as HCG is coming back. Our other hormones, progesterone, estradiol, those are slowly increasing over the course of pregnancy and then going to be coming down with delivery um, with the exception of the prolactin. Um, and then you're seeing spikes with, of oxytocin with breastfeeding episodes. Um, so that'll just be helpful to keep in mind. So I think some of the changes in the cardiovascular system during pregnancy are fascinating and really impressive. Um, and I was talking with one of my friends who's going into cardiology who said there's a um, burgeoning field of cardio obstetrics, um, which I think is really interesting and makes a lot of sense. So the, um, your cardiac output increases during pregnancy, and this is partly driven by an increase in cardiac output um, that, or sorry, increase in stroke volume that's thought to be driven by an increase in blood volume overall. Uh, average increase in blood volume is about 50% during pregnancy. Um, and then later in um, gestation, the increase in cardiac output is thought to be driven by an increase in heart rate. Um, and then at the same time, you're seeing a decrease in peripheral vascular resistance. Um, and the nadir is sort of around the second trimester. Um, and the decrease in peripheral vascular resistance is about 40% of baseline and the maximum cardiac output typically occurs during labor due to the catecholamine surge, as well as auto transfusions of blood, um, from the uterus to the systemic circulation and immediately post-delivery. And then about two weeks after delivery, maternal hemodynamics have returned to normal. So some people refer to pregnancy as nature's stress test because it can expose underlying previously silent cardiac pathology due to all of these stressors in terms of increased stroke volume and cardiac output that I've mentioned. Um, 
And cardio cardiovascular disease in pregnancy is the leading cause of mater maternal mortality in North America. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we have an increase in LV wall thickness and LV wall mass by 30 to 50% above pre-pregnancy values. Um, and there's some animal studies showing that temporary cardiac remodeling related to volume overload may play a role in these changes. Also have increased vascular elasticity. You have some four chamber dilatation with transient trivial MR, TR, and pulmonary regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation is not expected or normal. Um, in terms of heart sounds, after the first trimester, the first heart sound is typically louder um, and an injection systolic flow murmur can be heard in about 90% of patients and a third heart sound in 80% of patients. You can have increased heart rate on EKG, but typically you will not see frank tachycardia and some minor left or right axis shifts. Um, healthy women may experience some increased shortness of breath on exertion and fatigue. Um, an echocardiogram is the most common imaging used in pregnancy, but can have poor image quality and cardiac MRI is a safe alternative. And so I like this chart actually from Mixap that's sort of comparing some of the normal physiologic changes of pregnancy with pathologic changes. So we've mentioned some of them that you, um, the individuals might experience mild dyspnea, dyspnea with exertion, but any orthopnea, PND, cough, pulmonary edema would not be normal. Shouldn't be having any anginal symptoms, no chest pressure, heaviness, or pain with exertion. Um, mild peripheral edema is extremely common, but wouldn't be expecting more than mild edema. You can see some atrial ventricular premature beats, but wouldn't expect um, AFib or, or VTAC. And heart rate commonly will increase by 20 to 30%, but you wouldn't expect it to be um, as I mentioned, tachycardic or over 100 beats per minute. Um, a decrease in blood pressure is expected of about 10 millimeters of mercury. And then we mentioned some of the um, heart sound changes, changes and new murmurs that you might hear. Um, so thinking about cardi underlying cardiac conditions that confer extremely high risk of maternal mortality or severe morbidity, just throw some ideas out in the chat. What do you think might be some of these conditions in this category that would merit, you know, multidisciplinary evaluation and counseling with a cardiologist, an MFM, and an obstetric anesthesiologist? Um, pulmonary hypertension, absolutely. Um, Oh, John Cho, yes. We were also very concerned that her pass was greater than her systemic blood pressure. Very scary. Cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. MS. Yep, absolutely. I'm assuming you're meaning severe mitral stenosis by that. Yeah, exactly. So you guys are really nailed many of these here. So pulmonary hypertension, um, half breath previous pericardium, peripartum cardiomyopathy with any residual LV impairment, severe valvular dysfunction, um, severe aortic dilatation, um, vascular lr Danlos, severe coarctation, and Fontans with any complications. Um, and there's this great chart from the World Health Organization that goes through sort of a classification of um, these different uh, maternal cardiovascular conditions and the risks that they confer. So this was something I learned in preparing this talk is that vaginal delivery is generally preferred for patients with cardiovascular disease because it results in less blood loss, quicker recovery, and lower risk for thrombosis than C-section. Um, so vaginal delivery is typically accompanied by less severe fluid shifts. Um, patients are bolus before regional anesthesia, and there tends to be more IV fluids given in, in C-sections. Um, so that was something new for me. So kind of on the other end of the spectrum, cardiac conditions that confer no increased risk of maternal mortality include um, kind of small or mild valvular dysfunction like PDAs, mitral valve pre mitral valve prolapse, 
and then successfully repaired simple lesions like ASDs or VSDs, PDAs, um, and then atrial or ventricular topic beats. Um, and moderate LV impairment with an EF of 30 to 45%, that confers a significantly increased risk of maternal mortality or severe morbidity. That's kind of the next level below um, the previous slide. So just to speak to peripartum cardiomyopathy, so this is defined as LV systolic dysfunction towards the end of pregnancy typically, or in the months following delivery in the absence of any other identifiable cause. And risk factors include multiparity, age over 30, multifetal pregnancy, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, and tocolytic therapy, which are labor suppressants. And most women who develop peripartum cardiomyopathy recover fully, but in a prospective study, 13% had major cardiovascular events or persistent severe cardiomyopathy. Um, and women are treated with this condition are treated with many of the medications we're familiar with, such as beta blockers, hydralazine, nitrates, diuretics, but just a reminder that some of our go-to medications like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and aldosterone antagonists are teratogenic and would be avoided until after delivery. Um, now we're going to transition to the renal system in pregnancy. So um, pregnancy is associated with vasodilation of the systemic vasculature, as I was mentioning, and the maternal kidneys. And this starts as early as at five weeks. And this results in an increase in GFR and a decrease in serum creatinine and BUN. You're going to see enhanced activation in the RAS system early in pregnancy, and that leads to an increase in plasma volume at six to eight weeks, which rises progressively until late in the second trimester, early for early third trimester. And this helps maintain blood pressure and retain salt and water in the face of that maternal systemic and renal arterial dilation. And relaxin is a peptide hormone produced by the corpus luteum that's left behind after ovulation and it stimulates increased vasosuppressant secretion and drinking. So it's also involved in increasing your plasma volume. So total plasma volume increases 20 to 100% above pre-pregnancy levels. As I mentioned, average is around 50%. So really impressive increase and um, strain on the cardiovascular system. As a result, gestation-dependent edema, extremely common in up to 80% of women, and reduced plasma volume expansion is actually associated with preeclampsia. You can see some increase in proteinuria during pregnancy, but a reminder that greater than 300 milligrams per 24 hours is considered abnormal. And screening is often done with a spot urine to protein creatinine ratio like we use. Um, chronic kidney disease in pregnancy. So chronic kidney disease and the creatinine over 1.4 increases the risks associated with being pregnant. Um, complications include a number of issues that I've listed here, such as preeclampsia and progression to end-stage kidney disease, preterm delivery, um, IUGR. So preconception counseling regarding these risks is essential. Pregnancy is uncommon in patients on dialysis, which is associated with infertility. I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, pregnancy is more common in individuals with kidney transplants and outcomes are improved with optimized allograft function, so creatinine less than 1.5, and stable immunosuppressive regimen. So typically patients are advised to wait until one to two years after kidney transplantation. Calcineurin inhibitors have been used safely in pregnancy, um, but mycophenolate mofetil is teratogenic, um, and serolimus is also contraindicated. And this is just a summary of all of these changes of the cardiorenal system that we've talked about. So you have the increase throughout pregnancy of cardiac output, decrease in systemic vascular resistance, increase in heart rate, and overall the SVR is sort of going to outweigh the increase in cardiac output and heart rate and result in lower blood pressure um, through the first and second trimesters. You see an increase in plasma volume, which is greater relative to the increase in red blood cell mass, and that's re um, resulting in the physiologic anemia of pregnancy. 
So I just like how this kind of summarizes everything that we've covered so far. Um, just to briefly touch on the lungs during pregnancy. Um, so resting minute ventilation and tidal volume are increased. And one theory is that this may be due to increased CO2 production from increased metabolic demand during pregnancy. Progesterone also induces some hyperventilation and that causes a, comp a compensated respiratory alkalosis. So you'll see a slightly lower PCO2 and bicarb level. Expiratory reserve volume and functional residual capacity are also decreased. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. In terms of the GI system, I think many of us are familiar with these changes as well from medical school. Progesterone causes smooth muscle relaxation and relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. And that can result in delayed gastric emptying, prolonged small bowel transit time that can contribute to symptoms of acid reflux as well as constipation, can also reduce or alter bioavailability of drugs. Um, and the evolutionary purpose of this is to allow more time for nutrient um, absorption. And then hematologic changes during pregnancy are really fascinating. So pregnancy stimulates erythropoiesis assuming adequate nutrition and iron and vitamin supplements. Um, plasma volume, as I mentioned, increases more than the red blood cell mass, resulting in that physiologic anemia, hemoglobin around 11 is what's considered normal. Neutrophil count increases, um, and so you'll see a slightly higher normal white blood cell range. Platelet count declines as pregnancy progresses, but generally remains in the normal non-pregnant range and typically remains over 100K. You can see a mild decline from gestational thrombocytopenia and differentiating um, ITP from gestational thrombocytopenia can be a bit tricky, but ITP typically occurs earlier in pregnancy, has a lower platelet nadir, like less than 70K, and patients um, often have a history of thrombocytopenia before pregnancy. Um, any kind of moderate to severe thrombocytopenia, less than 100K can be a sign of a more serious cause, such as ITP, preeclampsia, HELP, um, TTP. Um, and as many of us remember, there's pregnancy is a prothrombotic state, and you have many of Virchow's uh, triad occurring during pregnancy, venous stasis from uterine compression, increased proag procoagulant factors, reduced anticoagulant factors, um, and reduced fibrinolysis. However, you don't see um, significant changes in uh, our coags, but D-dimer will be elevated. And this is just a summary of all of these changes that we've gone through. And I wanted to note in terms of the normal um, ranges for hemoglobin in terms of diagnosing anemia, so until last year, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and others had differing hemoglobin cutoffs to define anemia based on race. And this was likely leading to the undertreatment of anemia in many black women. And these guidelines were finally changed one year ago. Um, and here's kind of a paper that was talking about some of those changes. And that was something I was not aware of until preparing this talk. Um, rheumatology, another really important area where they may be overlap with obstetrics. So some diseases, and I don't think we understand why some rheumatologic diseases such as RA may improve during pregnancy, while others such as lupus are more likely to flare. Pregnancy itself can cause joint pains and fatigue that mimic rheumatologic disorders and or flares. Um, and women with lupus and in some cases RA are at greatest risk for pregnancy complications such as preeclampsia, preterm delivery, and low birth weight infants. Um, and antiphospholipid can lead to repeated early pregnancy losses, late term loss, or early preeclampsia. And care of these women is often close coordination between MFM and rheumatology. And to specifically to discuss lupus, since our patient that we were talking about had lupus, um, patients with lupus desiring pregnancy are advised to wait until their disease has been well-controlled for at least six months to reduce some of the risks that we were discussing. 
Um, as I mentioned in talking about kidney disease, certain therapies like mycophenolate mofetil, also bulimumab and methotrexate should be avoided because they're teratogenic and should be discontinued about at least three months before conception is attempted. And these meds can be switched to azathioprine. Hydroxychloroquine is safe in pregnancy as are steroids, although side effects such as hypertension and hyperglycemia have to be closely monitored. So wanting to come back to our case um, before we talk about maternal mortality, just a reminder, she was a 30 year old woman with well-controlled lupus, prior miscarriages, hypertension, currently 10 weeks pregnant, presenting with subacute progressive shortness of breath, found to have severe pulmonary hypertension. Her OB ultrasound demonstrated an entity I'd never heard of called Pentology of Cantrell, a very rare and lethal anomaly. And so termination was recommended and was desired by the patient, but there was concern for her stability to undergo the procedure. Initially, she was kept on bed rest due to near syncope with ambulation to the bathroom. She was gently diuresed. She was started on sildenafil and her symptoms improved with these therapies. She underwent a right heart cath. It confirmed severely elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, severely elevated mean pulmonary artery pressures, normal left-sided filling pressures. She had a VQ scan without evidence of CTEF. Her PET CT showed concern for large vessel vasculitis. Rheumatology felt that this was relate, likely related to her lupus. So in terms of connective tissue diseases, um, remember that systemic sclerosis has the highest um, likelihood of uh, a relation or, you know, relationship with pulmonary hypertension, but lupus is second most common. Uh, rheumatology recommended starting her on prednisone and cyclophosphamide. And then there was one of the most beautiful interdisciplinary meetings that I think I've ever witnessed between OB, anesthesia, the pH specialists within pulmonology, um, and rheumatology to discuss optimal timing um, for her DNC and the optimization of her pH, her thrombocytopenia, and various anesthetic options for her DNC. And I think for me, it was just, it was such a humbling reminder of, despite all these specialists having profound, deep knowledge in their areas, there was a lot of fear and uncertainty of the unknown. So fear of the pulmonary hypertension for the OBs and fear of the pregnancy for the pulmonologists. And so by being, asking really open kind of vulnerable questions about what they didn't know, um, we were just able to have this great discussion and come up with a really safe um, plan for her. And so she was scheduled in the main OR ultimately with moderate sedation and a paracervical block, and she tolerated the procedure well. Her thrombocytopenia ultimately was felt to be driven um, by her lupus activity, it was not felt to be ITP or anything more sinister and um, sort of gradually or sort of spontaneously improved over the following days while she was hospitalized. Um, any questions? Yeah, John, yeah, about, sorry, I didn't mention that about elevated D-dimer levels. So there are actually different, um, let me see if I can go back here. I didn't mention that here on my chart. Yeah. So there's different cutoffs for D-dimer levels during pregnancy that you can see, and actually for the first trimester versus second versus third. Um, and then I did mention that there's a different um, kind of, uh, year, there's this thing called the years criteria that can be used to help risk stratify, um, thinking about getting imaging for PEs. Um, and then, Perfect. And yeah, thank you, Dr. Burke, for adding about um, end stage renal disease in cis women and some of the hormonal changes there. Okay, perfect. All right, so now we're going to transition to um, talking about maternal mortality. Oops, sorry. Um, in the US. So obviously, this is a tremendous issue. This is defined as the death of a woman while pregnant or within one year 
from the end of her pregnancy or their pregnancy, I should say, from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy. Um, and you can see this trend of overall increases in maternal mortality in the US. I think it's the cause for this overall increase is not fully understood. It's thought that maybe it's related to some increased identification of pregnancy related deaths and increased reporting. Um, but a third of deaths occur during pregnancy, over half occur during labor or within a week postpartum, and 13% occur between six weeks and one year postpartum. Um, and most of the deaths occurring in that six, to, six weeks to one year postpartum are related to mental health, substance use disorders, and chronic conditions. Um, not receiving adequate treatment, such as hypertension, diabetes, chronic heart disease. Um, and you can see some of the causes in this, uh, that cardiovascular disease is, you know, a very um, prominent cause of maternal pregnancy-related death in the U.S. And overall, there's been the contributions from hemorrhage, hypertensive disorders like preeclampsia and anesthetic complications have declined over time, and we've seen an increase in contributions from cardiovascular, cerebrovascular accidents and other medical conditions. And so I think this really reflects the need for management of better management of these chronic conditions. Um, in Washington state, we also have Medicaid coverage for 12 months postpartum, and there's a lot of pushes for that to be expanded in other states. Um, and hemorrhage is still a really important player in terms of mortality during labor. And California is the front runner for setting in place protocols for early recognition and treatment of hemorrhage. Um, and so I think all of us are aware of the profound inequities in mort maternal mortality in the US. So um, non-Hispanic black individuals are over three times more likely than non-Hispanic white individuals to suffer from pregnancy-related mortality. Um, Non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native individuals also are at much, much higher risk. Um, and these inequities increase by maternal age and persist across education levels. Black and Hispanic women are also at significantly higher risk for severe maternal morbidity, such as preeclampsia, um, cardiomyopathy, PE and high blood pressure um, are also associated with a higher share of pregnancy related deaths among black women compared to white women. And some of the thoughts on contributing factors to these disparities um, include health and in differences in health insurance coverage, access to care. So for example, rural hospital closures have disproportionately impacted black women racism and discrimination. And so some of the interventions have been around addressing bias and racism and responding to patients' concerns, um, access to certified nurse midwives and doulas um, who are often really important advocates for um, women and concerns they might have during pregnancy, labor, and postpartum, um, training BIPOC providers. So there's some data showing improvement in black infant mortality when cared for by black physicians. And as we mentioned, extending postpartum Medicaid eligibility. So this is a whole list of recommendations from the CDC for reducing black maternal mortality. And I just wanted to highlight some of the ones that I think internists can be involved, some of the roles internists can be involved in playing. Um, so there are three that I highlighted here. One is helping patients manage chronic conditions like diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, and obesity. We 100% see that as our wheelhouse. Um, coordinating ongoing care, health care for women before, during, and in particular after pregnancy. And then I really appreciated this last one, training non-obstetric providers to consider recent pregnancy history. And so I want us to feel free to just put this in the chat, just to brainstorm based on all this material we've covered, what do you feel like would be important information to know about an individual's obstetric history who you might be meeting for the first time in clinic or um, that you might be meeting for the first time in the hospital and you know taking care of um, for a new diagnosis of heart failure or whatever it might be.
Yeah, exactly, Annie. So asking about gestational diabetes, if they have had any history of preeclampsia or really any complications during their pregnancies. Um, so perfect. So for all new patients who've been pregnant before, it's important to review a history of conditions such as gestational diabetes and preeclampsia, which may increase risk um, of future chronic disease. Gestational diabetes increases lifetime risk of type two diabetes. I saw different numbers on exactly how much that increases, um, but they recommend hemoglobin A1C should be checked three to six months postpartum and then every three years thereafter. Postpartum depression is another common condition for internists to be aware of as they may be seeing patients in the year after delivery. Um, it's common, uh, commonly occurring in one out of seven women and estimates are that it's been more common during COVID and occurring in one out of five to six women. Um, the Edinburgh postpartum depression scale can be used for screening as well as the PHQ-9. Preeclampsia increases overall risk for future cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease. The risk is less in patients with gestational hypertension. And just as a reminder, so that's blood pressure that starts occurring 20 weeks um, gestation or after and is not accompanied by any proteinuria or end organ damage. And then just a reminder, don't forget to be checking in about pregnancy intention and need for contraception moving forward for all patients with the uterus. So I just wanted to wrap up um, with a few mix up questions. Um, so you'll be able to um, put one in your, put an answer in. So this is a 31 year old woman coming in for preconception counseling. She has lupus and lupus nephritis, which has been stable for the past year. She has had no proteinuria for more than 12 months. She feels well. Medications are mycophenolate mofetil, hydroxychloroquine, and low-dose prednisone, which should be discontinued prior to, um, prior to conception. So go ahead and answer that. Okay, perfect. So you guys did a great job. Mycophenolate mock deal. Exactly. So first things being first, wanting to make sure we have disease stability in a patient with lupus before she's going to be trying, or they're going to be trying to get pregnant. Um, so they, they've been stable for more than 12 months. Um, and then, um, so mycophenolate mofetil is associated with first trimester pregnancy loss and fetal malformations of the distal limbs, heart, esophagus, kidneys, and cleft lip and palate. Um, it's also contraindicated in women who are breastfeeding because it's excreted into breast milk. Um, and I just saw a wonderful chat reminder from Sarah in thinking about when you might be seeing a patient who is postpartum and checking in about lactation and breastfeeding, um, which she might be doing a separate talk on possibly. Um, okay. Another question. We'll just do two more of these. So 28 year old woman is seeking preconception counseling. She has a three-year history of primary hypertension. Um, otherwise no medical history. Uh, she's on Ramipril home blood pressure monitoring shows her blood pressures are 126 to 72. Um, no evidence of retinopathy, LVH or kidney disease. What's the most appropriate management here? Oopsies. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, most people responded. Here we awesome. Go. Great. Okay. So this one was a little bit more. Um, yeah. People wanted to, most people wanted to discontinue Ramipril and start hydrolyzing. The Correct answer is technically just discontinuing Ramipril, actually. Um, so you all identified that ACE inhibitors are contraindicated during pregnancy, they're teratogenic. What's interesting is, so part one, 
aspect of this question is um, that you will expect some decrease in blood pressure over the course of becoming pregnant. And so they may not need any kind of antihypertensive medication. The other um, aspect is that chronic hypertension guidelines for pregnant women are more permissive than our hypertension guidelines that we're typically following for our non-pregnant patients. And so um, for pregnant women, a uh, systolic blood pressure between 120 to less than 160 is recommended and a diastolic of 80 to less than 110. Um, and so odds are she might, she would be within those ranges, even off of these medications. Dr. Burke, I don't know if you have any other, if you would answer this question differently than Mixap or have any other. No, I, I totally agree. And I think you bring up the point appropriately about just our blood pressure cutoffs. And that was something I kind of threw into the chart earlier. It's, you know, we allow a lot higher blood pressure than, especially with the revised guidelines over the last couple of years. Um, we probably make a lot of internists uncomfortable with our patients cruising around at like 140 in the upper 70s, low 80s. Um, but we, we need to think about the blood th flow through the placenta. And when we have too tight control, we have limited blood flow and then we see fetal growth restriction. So that's kind of the physiology piece of why, it, why, why you can kind of wrap your head around making it make sense. And then if you go to the physiology of pregnancy and all of these changes, um, correct. We tend to see blood pressure go down a bit and we didn't tend to be a little more permissive um, just because we know the fetal effects are pretty significant. If someone has been in the like one upper one thirties, low one forties, and then we bring them down to tighter control, we tend to see detrimental fetal effects. Um, the other piece here is, you know, it's, you'll see different medications used to control hypertension in pregnancy, both primary and gestational hypertension. Um, and then for those of you who did medical school at UW, we kind of have our own gestalt on how we do it. And it doesn't always match kind of what is on the test nationally. And so we use a lot of atenolol in pregnancy, which is not typically what you would find in your mix app or um, different board exams. Um, and, but you'll see it in a lot of the patients. So if you're consulting with us on patients, you'll be like, why are they on a tenolol? Like, I didn't think, I don't remember learning that. Um, so we just, we do it a little bit differently. So yes, we, hydralazine is considered safe. We use it a lot. Um, and spironolactone, um, we typically try to avoid just because of the um, androgenic effects. And mm -hmm. particularly if there is a male fetus growing, we can see um, some, especially earlier in pregnancy, um, we could see some changes in the um, sex organs. Interesting. That was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, that physiology of why you're not wanting to be as aggressive with blood pressure control is really helpful. Um, I'm going to fly by this question since I want to give, make sure we have some time for questions in the last couple minutes. Um, so just to summarize um, what we covered today. So individuals undergo multiple physiologic and quite frankly, impressive changes during pregnancy, particularly of the cardiorenal system. And it's important for internists and especially subspecialists and consultative internists um, to be aware of physiologic versus potential pathologic changes. Um, and I know that some of you who will be fellows next year or the year after will definitely be getting consults on pregnant patients, and hopefully you feel a little bit more ready for that. Um, the care of individuals with chronic medical conditions during pregnancy may require close collaboration between subspecialists and MFM specialists. Asking patients about prior complications during pregnancies can provide important prognostic information about their health risks. And lastly, rates of maternal mortality in the US are unacceptably high and marked by unjust racial inequities with higher risk for black and American Indian Alaska Native in, um, patients. And internists can play a role in helping to combat these inequities by managing chronic illnesses, particularly cardiovascular disease risk factors, improving coordination of care postpartum and inquiring about pregnancy history. Um, and so, happy to open it up to any questions, anything else, Dr. Burke, that you wanted to share that you think is important for us internists to hear. Um, and thanks everyone for participating in your attention. 
There's John had a comment in the chat about D dimer levels and looking at PE, and um, he is correct that the D dimer levels vary by trimester, and typically um, they tend to increase um, throughout pregnancy. And so we have different cutoffs when if we are using D dimer. In general, it's not that helpful um, in pregnant folks just because the levels vary so much. Um, and so if we have a concern, um, we will go to the next step rather than just rely on a dimer Nice work, Anna. I agree with everyone in the chat. Dr. Berg, I was wondering, um, I've seen at least two patients who are having a lot of like back pain and musculoskeletal pain in pregnancy. And, um, I was wondering if you have like a typical strategy for people with like new, really bad back pain. Um, and when you typically do more work up or attribute it just to changes. Physiology, yeah. Physiologic yeah. changes of pregnancy. I think some of it, um, I mean, I think some of it is what part of pregnancy and, um, you know, I think the first case really, illustrated it, the, the case that Anna shared, where it's like someone who's 10 weeks pregnant, sorry, we can't blame, or eight weeks pregnant, like we can't blame pregnancy for what's going on. We got to think outside that box. Um, it's really easy to see that positive UPT and kind of be like, call OB, it, it must be pregnancy related. Um, and like I had a, a ED consult to admit someone and I'm so thankful for my medicine colleagues because she was six and a half weeks pregnant and they're like, oh, she's having shortness of breath and this and that, and she needs to be admitted. And I was like, what's her COVID swab? And they're like, oh, it's positive. And I'm like, so maybe could we treat her COVID and then deal with the pregnancy later? Um, because I was like, you know, physiologically, she's not pregnant yet. So one is when is this, is this pain developing and kind of what is the course? And if it seems like it is developing kind of in the second and third trimester as the body is changing and the growing uterus is putting, you know, putting that, that, that strain, especially on the lumbar spine, but really it's, it's the change in curvature of the pelvis and then the lower in the spine that causes a lot of those musculoskeletal changes. And so if the timeline's seems pretty, you know, straightforward that it's musculoskeletal. I get patients um, in massage. Some patients really like acupuncture, um, you know, gentle stretches, yoga for folks who do that. I get on my hands and knees and teach pretty much every pregnant patient cat cow. Um, and, you know, most people can do that. And it is so great for adding more stretch to the low back and um, hamstrings. Um, so, really it's kind of like, are there other red flags, just like with any back pain workup, are there, you know, the way the onset of the symptoms, any other systemic complaints, anything else that's jumping out that like, maybe this isn't just boring old back pain related to pregnancy. Um, and then we would look, be doing more of a workup. Um, but most people it's, it, you know, it's try the supportive measures and um, do some more stretching, et cetera. Physical therapy is awesome. Um, and, you know, I put in a lot of PT consults um, during pregnancy for folks to just kind of get some guidance because many people don't even know how to stretch. Um, and so, you know, a couple visits with our physical therapists and they get some teaching on how to stretch more effectively. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, um, I think we'll go ahead and take our break unless there's any other pressing questions. Um, so let's get started. We'll come back right at 10 o'clock to start with our next talk um, so that everybody has a chance to take a break here. Um, awesome, I'll see you in a few minutes. Nice work.